good afternoon, and thank you all very much for attending this, um, this defense for warm up, Alex Rodriguez Malave. Um, a quick note before I go on there will be a reception following the talk uh, back in the factory building uh, in room 9240. Um, so, what can I say about you, Norma? Um, so, Norma entered the, entered the access program at UCLA back in 2010. Um, and she rotated through my lab in the spring of 2011. Uh, she was the second graduate student to join my lab, so uh, very uh, proud of her for all the work that she's done since then. Um, so early on, Norma showed an enthusiasm for tackling difficult questions, and we had this nascent project in our lab looking at uh, the role of long non-coding RNAs in uh, leukemia. And so Norma, uh, very bravely, decided to tackle this very ambitious project. Uh, and along with others in the lab, including Philini Fernando and Ella Waters, um, began to work on this uh, project regarding these long non-coding RNAs. And I think you'll see today that uh, with a lot of hard work, effort, perseverance, and um, some creative thinking, um, Norma's really moved this field forward, and we've, uh, we're beginning to understand a little bit more about the role of these long run coding RNAs in leukemia. Um, so uh, I think long term, this work has implications for diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment of leukemia as well. Uh, so without further ado, Norma. Activate 
or request the parental consent. Additionally, they can uh, act as scaffold and bring transcription factors uh, to the promoter regions, or they can actually ask, act as decoys, inhibiting them from finding. Also, they can, they've been involved in splicing. They can actually modulate the levels of phosphorylated three and arginine rich splice factors along the nuclear speckles and modulate splicing. Now, in the cytoplasm, they have been shown to be involved in mRNA stability, specifically by interacting with stout proteins, kind of promoting or inhibiting mRNA decay. Uh, also, they've been seen to regulate translation binding perfectly throughout the messenger RNA, and this can actually help um, engage the, the ribosome onto the mRNA, promoting the translation, or actually inhibit this engagement. And last but not least, they can act as competitive endogenous RNA, which means that they can act as sponges uh, for microRNAs, inhibiting these uh, short transcripts from binding to their targets. It is not surprising that with their multiple important roles in biological processes, that they have been seen as regulated in a variety of malignancies. Now, this <coughs> is a look at a few examples of linked RNA, some of them very well known, for example, hot air. Uh, the malignancy in which they were found as regulated, and if they can function either as a tumor suppressor in oncogene or a putative marker. Now, in the RAL lab, our research mainly focuses on B cells. And as we all know, B cell development is a very complex and highly orchestrated process. Now, this process can be interrupted uh, by mutations. And these mutations could lead to developmental arrest and gain a, prolifer a proliferative advantage, which are two key hallmarks of leukemic transformation. Now, Recent studies have actually uncovered different linker RNAs involved in B cell development and also have been implicated and correlated with malignancies at every different uh, cell stage. Efforts have been made to understand the role of these linker RNAs in hematological malignancies, and this table compiles some of the work that has been done, particularly in malignancies. Uh, derived from the bone marrow. Now, uh, these malignancies include in their list acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which we'll talk about more later. However, these studies are limited in their scope, and they do not demonstrate how the link RNA is involved in the pathogenesis of the disease. So, B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, also known as BAAL, is a neoplasm that arises from precursor B cells, which have been seen to harbor different mutations and translocations. Um, this is the most important bone marrow derived lymphoid malignancy and the most common malignancy seen in children. While the majority of the cases have favorable prognosis and are chemotherapeutically treatable, there are cases that um, have very poor prognosis and no viable treatment. For example, BCR able translocated cases and MLL mixed lineage leukemia uh, translocated cases. In particular, um, MLL can actually occur in infants under 12 months old, and they have a particularly poor prognosis if they have the MLL A4 translocation. So, in our effort to further understand link RNAs and BAL, we carried out a comprehensive study of their expression in patient samples. And our findings uh, were published recently, and I'm going to highlight some of the important points of this paper. Uh, at first, we carried out an adult microarray at an initial set of 20 cases. Um, we did hierarchical clustering and we looked at expression of protein coding genes. And as you can see, by looking just at the expression of the genes, the different patient samples were able to segregate all, uh, to the different
cytogenetic abnormalities that the patient had. Now, when we carried out the same analysis, when we only focused on link RNA, again, we see that patient samples were able to segregate into the different uh, karyotypes. And importantly, as you can see, the MLL expression profile of link RNA is much distinctive than any of the other two. Now, this kind of demonstrates that link RNA is expression is highly predictive of the uh, BAL karyotype. So this is just a representation of the strategy that we use in order to pinpoint which link RNA we were interested in uh, looking into. So after we did our microarray analysis, we had a variety of link RNA. So we decided to look at those um, that were the minimum number necessary in order to predict the karyotype successfully. And that was carried out by doing nearest chunking centric analysis. Later we looked at their expression and compared that to a, a regular pro B cell and uh, verified if it was dysregulated or highly dysregulated. We also looked to see if there were any available transcript models such as ES ESTs and mRNAs for these link RNAs. And finally, we decided to focus on those which their expression was highest in the chemic sample. And from this long list, we were able to filter it down to four very interesting link RNAs in which we termed them BAL-associated long RNAs, or Baylors. Uh, among these four is Baylor 1, Baylor 2, Baylor 6, and link 00958. That one already had a designation, so we kept it as well. So first we carried out quantitative real-time PCR to confirm the expression of these four linker RNAs in our patient sample, those initial 20 cases along with the independent cohort. Uh, and as you can see here, this is just a quantification of their expression in different DAL uh, recurrent translocations. Sorry. As well as patient samples that did not have any distinct uh, karyotypes and compared those to normal C19 positive B cells. What's interesting is that the MLL translocated cases were the most distinct expression or different expression in all of the linker RNAs when they were compared to any of the other translocations. Notably, if you look at Baylor 2 and Baylor 6, we see that the expression of these are high in all patient samples when compared to C19 positive uh, normal B cells. Now, we wanted to examine if link RNA expression could predict patient outcome, so we analyzed um, the available clinical pathologic parameters that we have, such as patient survival and resistance to treatment. So first, we segregated the patient sample between low expressing and high expressing for each one of the link RNAs. And as you can see here in these kaplan mayer survival curves, uh, all patient samples with high expression of any of the link RNAs had overall worse survival. In particular, patients with high expression of Baylor 2 and Baylor 6 had worse overall in comparison to any of the other two link RNAs. So looking at the other parameter, resistance to treatment, what we observe is that when we compare uh, patient samples that were responsive to chemotherapeutic treatment versus patient samples that were not, we see that there is a high expression of Baylor 2 in these non-responsive cases and statistically significant when you quantity um, the expression of these transcripts. We see a similar trend for Baylor 6 but this is not statistically different. Uh, statistically significant. This kind of falls in line that um, Baylor 2 seems to be very high in patients that are non-responsive to treatment and they can become resistant to treatment by that expression. So we wanted to see what happened with the expression of these two Baylors when we took human BAL cell lines and treated them with different chemotherapeutic reagents. Um, as you can see here, this is just a quantitation of their expression when the RS411 human BAL cell line and non 6 cell line were treated with either prednisolone, dexamethasone, and doxorubicin. And as you can see here for Baylor 2 specifically, its expression is downregulated both in RS411 and in non 6 cells when these cell lines are treated with glutocorticoid 
have shown that link RNA expression can correlate with the DAL cytogenetic subtypes, and that the expression can also correlate with different clinopathological parameters, such as poor patient survival and resistance to treatment. So these findings um, led us to, uh, to want to pursue two link RNAs in particular, beta 2 and beta 6. And this is what I will be talking to you guys today. I will first start off with beta 2 since we found that very interesting because of what's happening with prednisone response. And the second part of my talk, I'll talk to you more about beta 6, which was the primary focus of my research in the lab. So to further study Baylor 2 and BAL, we designed SIRNAs with a unique expression factor, made lentivirus, and transduced different human BAL cell lines. Here is just a quantitation showing successful uh, knockdown of Baylor 2 with three different SIRNAs. This knockdown in RS411 cells led to a significant decrease in proliferation. Moreover, when we took um, 697 human BAL cell line, which has low endogenous levels of beta 2 and overexpressed it, we then saw an increase in proliferation in the cell line. So taken together, this points to a potential role of beta 2 in BAL cell survival. Now to understand how beta 2, um, what's the mechanism of beta 2, in BAL survival, we decided to uh, examine uh, global differential expression in transduced cell lines with SIRNA2, which has the strongest phenotype against BAL cell lines, and take these cell lines and treat them with DMSO. So this is just a hierarchical clustering in which we identified uh, different groups of genes that were highly upregulated in these cell lines, RS411 cell lines, that were either knocked down with Baylor 2, that were knocked down with Baylor 2 and treated and untreated with prednisolone. And as you can see here, among these gene clusters that were identified were genes involved in the glutocorticoid response pathway, specifically June and FOS, to name a few. Now, additional gene intolerance gene analysis uh, showed a significant enrichment of different pathways, including the glucocorticoid receptor signaling pathway. Now, to confirm our microarray findings, we wanted to quantitate the expression of these different genes in murine 7 lc 3 cells. So, uh, upon antiRNA mediated knockdown of the marine homolog of Baylor 2, we can see here by Western plot analysis uh, elevated expression of FOS protein, June protein, and BIM protein. BIM is a targeted June and it's a pro apoptotic gene. Now, conversely, when we overexpress the marine homolog, uh, marine homolog of Baylor 2, what we see is a decrease in the transcription level of these three genes. So overall, these findings demonstrate parallel effects between uh, Baylor 2 expression and prednisone treatment. Now, and you can see this in ex the expression in multiple human and marine cell lines. Now, the exact mechanism of how Baylor 2 carries out um, its role in the glutocorticoid response pathway is still being investigated. But what we do know is that Baylor 2 can regulate the expression of FOS and June, in turn, June regulates them, and that upon glutocorticoid binding to its receptor, something happens that's inhibiting the expression of Baylor 2 while it is promoting this pathway. Yet, when we see Baylor 2 highly expressed, in 
wanted to know more of its uh, more about its location and more molecular characterization of it. So as you can see here, Baylor 6 is, con is in human chromosome 3. It's conserved in a, syn in a synthetic block with CDP1 divided in SAP1. And when we look at histone modification analyses by ENCODE, we could see that there were epigenetic marks, particularly um, histone 3 lysine 4 trimethylation and histone 3 lysine 36 trimethylation, along with promoter and gene body in four different cell lines, in indicating this as a transcriptional element. Moreover, 100 vertebrae fan comps showed signals of high conservation throughout the gene body of this loci, indicating a functional transcript. We carried out sequence alignment and we identified uh, conservation by black in numerous vertebrate, vertebrates of these, this synthetic block, um, and some of these vertebrates including mice, chicken, and zebra. So taking all this data together, we can see that this is a highly conserved functional locus. Now, during normal B-cell development, we can see um, a dynamic expression of Baylor 6, with the highest expression being at the pre-B-cell stage and subsequent downregulation. Now, this suggests that there may be high expression of Baylor 16 <coughs> in, the, in the BL patient samples uh, representing a stage-specific expression pattern uh, in these leukemias that are derived from early developmental states. Now, to elucidate the cellular function, we first wanted to see the expression in different human BAL cell lines. And as you can see here, um, the highest expression of the 6 was seen in R411 and MB411 cell lines, which are ML rearranged, and specifically, containing the MLLPA4 transportation. This mimicking some of the work I showed previously in which the expression of Baylor 6 was highest in MLL transportation cases. The note, the uh, 697 cells and not 6 cells displayed low expression of Baylor 6. Then we decided to take human r lab cells and treat them with a bromodomain binding protein inhibitor, IBET-151. This inhibitor has been previously shown to inhibit transcription downstream um, of MLL. When we treated the cell line, we can see that the expression of Baylor 6 is downregulated in a dose dependent manner. So it is possible that MLLAF4 may be regulating Baylor 6 upstream. But since this inhibitor is not specific for MLLAF4, you know, there could be other uh, bromodomain binding proteins or MLL proteins that are regulating. Now, using the approach we described, I described previously for Baylor 2, we designed SRNAs to knock down Baylor 6 in, in a variety of human BAL cell lines. Here you can see a quantification of their expression and their successful knockdown in R411 and RH cells. Knockdown caused a significant decrease in proliferation in both these cell lines. Furthermore, when we did flow cytometry, and carried out cell cycle analyses of R411 cells, we saw that the cell lines that had srna 2 uh, overexpression had an increase in sub B0 cells and a decrease at all other stages, indicating an increase in apoptosis and a decrease, a decrease in flux in the rest of the cell cycle stages. Now, these findings suggest that there's an important role for human Baylor 2 in the regulation of BAL cells for bias. So, to further understand Baylor 6, we decided to characterize the transcripts that are originating from this flow site. Now, uh, alternative splicing analysis by the uh, Swiss Institute of 
replicated X cells that were discovered in the gem. Now, northern blot analyses uh, looking at R4 11 DNA treated RNA, we were able to find two isoforms with, that have exon 3 and exon 5 annotated sequences around the 3.8 and 1.2 uh, kilobases. So, together with these data show that this is a complex gene locus and there's multiple non coding transcripts, some of them yet to be discovered. So after we cloned these isoforms, we carried out uh, gain of function analyses in urine cell lines. Specifically, these are two independent experiments, and we overexpress isoform 1 and isoform 3. Even though they're two independent experiments, you can see the similarities. Successful overexpression led to an increase in proliferation, and you can see a decrease in sub D0 cells and an increase in the other cell stages. So, we've seen here that both knockdown and overexpression of beta 6 has opposing effects, opposing phenotypes in the AL cell lines. So, these findings show a modest but conserved role for beta 6 in the regulation of BAL cell survival and proliferation. Now, since beta 6 is highly expressed in the AL, we wanted to look at the effects of constitutive expression of BR6 in emerging models. So we took biofuel enriched bone marrow and we retrovirally transduced our dual promoter vector system that has ISO3 and we transplanted them into lethally irradiated mice and observed these mice for four months or, uh, pre or three morbid symptoms arose. So we did peripheral peripheral bleeds every four weeks for 16 weeks. Now, when we did flow cytometry of the bone marrow, we saw an in relative increase in proportion of hematopoietic progenitor cells. So after discriminating the differentiated cells and looking at um, the lineage negative stop positive seeking positive cells, we see a significant increase when looking specifically at the GSD positive compartment. We also see an increase in hematopoietic stem cells and an increase in lymphoid prime multipotent progenitor cells. So here is the representative fact plot. And as you can see to the right, it's just the quantitation of the relative proportion of these cells. Now, we did carry further analyses in the um, subsequent B cell stages, and we did see a trend of increase up to the C prime party fraction, but then the numbers stabilized. And that makes sense since when we looked at changes in the periphery of the mice, we did not see any significant changes when we looked at the white blood cell count or the red blood cell count. What we did see was an overall increase of GSP positive C220 B cells throughout the experiment in mice overexpressing isoform 3. Additionally, we saw a decrease overall during the experiment of GSP positive CD11 myeloid cells in the isoform, isoform 3 expressing mice. Gross analyses of different lymphoid tissues and major organs did not reveal any differences, and when we did microscopic analyses of hematoxylin and eosinstein uh, lymphoid tissues here, spleen and liver, we again didn't see any statistical difference, any significant differences between them. So taking all these findings together, we can see that Baylor 6 can enrich um, early developmental stages, maybe a giving, maybe conferring a survival advantage or increasing their proliferation. Now, mechanistically, we know that link RNAs can um, act as transcriptional regulators. So we wanted to see if Baylor 6 could act in the same way. So we isolated RNA from RS411 cells with sRNA overexpression, and we carried out a microanalysis to look at global differential expression of genes. And as you can see here by hierarchical clustering, there is a on and off, turning on and off of different genes. 
felt that the highest uh, number of genes differentially expressed fall in crystalline binding molecular function. Now, we carried out a disease association analysis uh, to look at what um, diseases were enriched. And of these 38 different diseases, we see in here in dark red that 14 of those were actually of leukemic origin. So it's about one third of the diseases that came out significantly enriched. Further, when we did transcriptor factin target enrichment analyses, we see that there is a high enrichment for dysregulated genes that are targeted by SD1 and other well-known transcription factors. And if we didn't know the transcription factor, the sequence motif is delineated as far. So we carried out a validation microarray with technical replicates, um, of also RS411 RNA, this time only with srna 2 which has the strongest phenotype. And what we see again, and we can confirm this global differential expression when we were sick is knocked down. Notably, we were able to confirm again that there is an enrichment of genes that are targeted by SD1. Additionally, we also saw enrichment for genes that are targeted by CREB. CREB is an interact, interact between partner of SD1 and is also a target of SD1. Now, the only disease that was significantly enriched in our analyses were leukemia. So again, kind of showing dysregulated gene leukemia and a possible um, role of failure 6 uh, involved in SD1 mediated transcription. So as indicated by description factor enrichment analysis, we did confirm that SD1 expression and CREB1 expression correlated with failure 6 dysregulation. So as seen here in human RS411 RDH cell lines that have a uh, knockdown of failure 6, we see downregulation on the expression of SD1 transcript as well as CREB1 transcripts. In contrast, when we overexpress the human isoform of the figure six in the murine zone of these three cell lines, we see an increase in the expression of murine SD1 and murine CREB1. <coughs> so, to further understand the relationship between failure six and SD1, we looked at the promoter regions of known targets. As I described earlier, CREB1 promoter and also P21, which is another SD1 target. Here you can see that along the promoter sequences, there are different SD1 binding sites highlighted in these blue boxes. Now, when uh, luciferase reporter assay, uh, in which either SP1, failure 6, isoform 1, or isoform 3 were overexpressed into 19 PT cells, we see an increase in luciferase activity both in the CREB1 promoter and in the P21 promoter. But what's interesting is that we, when you co-overexpress SP1 in any of the two isoforms, you see an enhancement of this SP1-mediated transcription also in both <coughs> promoter regions. Uh, furthermore, <coughs> it's interesting that in the P21 promoter, when we overexpress SP1 and both of the isoforms, we have to be having even higher enhancement of uh, transcriptional activity. So together, this data provides a putative mechanism for the regulation of failure 6 in BAL. Now, so overall, these findings demonstrate a role of failure 6 in BAL survival, suggesting an important role for it in the SD1 transcription. So, Exactly the mechanism of action we're still trying to delineate, and those are the studies we're carrying out right now. But as we know, failure 6 can regulate the expression of SD1 and CREB1. And when failure 6 is upregulated, it can enhance the transcription of different SD1 target genes, such as P21 and CREB1. In addition, SD1 and CREB1 do interact and are able to regulate other genes. So there may be something more happening with failure 6. So in summary, this thesis has been able to show that there are very important link RNAs involved in BAL cell survival, in particular, Baylor 2 and Baylor 6, as you described. Baylor 2 can act as a glutocorticoid receptor signaling regulator, which has strong implications in chemotherapy, specifically in patients that are not responsive 
one mediated transcription and promote the expansion of hemiploidic progenitor cells in vivo. So these are among the first <coughs> in-depth studies of linked for RNAs in the cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and I've been able to show that they have a diagnostic and prognostic utility. These studies lay down the groundwork to understand the role of linked for RNAs in hematopoiesis and leukogenesis. And with ongoing advancements of high proof techniques and the recurring discovery of novel linked for RNA molecular functions, the plethora of non coding RNAs and their mechanisms of action are yet to be exhausted. So, although this thesis had made significant strides to delineate, Role of non coding RNAs in VAL, there's still much we need to uncover and more things to continue on this project. For example, we can look at infant regulation of neighboring genes by failures. So, even though um, link RNAs have a putative cis regulatory capacity, very few of these have been shown to actually sit. Now, we have some preliminary data on the regulation of failure six, of, sorry, of failure six regulating SAP-1 and CBC-1 and 5 SAP-1 is interesting since recently has been shown to be a very important regulator in hematopoietic um, commitment and self-renewal. Additionally, we can look at the upstream regulators of these failures. For example, is MLA-4 regulating its transcription or what, or what other BT binding proteins can be involved? Initially, we can look at the importance of Baylor 6 and Baylor 6 and Baylor 2 in hematopoiesis. But first, for Baylor 6, we need to uncover a nearing homolog. And even though we have some sequences by ray, we still uh, need to uncover a full isomer. Um, in order to look at the importance of hematopoiesis, we can either knock out or knock down these uh, Baylors and wall type mice. And furthermore, we can look at their role in pathogenesis in vivo by either knocking out or knocking down these failures in acute lymphoblastic leukemia mouse models. So I think I went a little quickly, uh, a little faster than I expected, but all of this work uh, couldn't be done with so many people that have helped me out throughout the years, uh, which I would like to acknowledge. First of all, I really want to thank my PI, Dr. Dinesh Rao, uh, for giving me the opportunity to be in his lab. Um, he was new in UCLA, and so was I, and it was a little bit of a gamble, but it all worked out beautifully in the end. And I really want to thank you um, for believing in me, even when I thought no one else believed in me or my research, even myself. Of course, I want to thank my committee members, Dr. Greg Payne, which helped in my recruitment to UCLA. Thank you for your mentoring and for letting me rotate in your lab and expand my knowledge. Uh, Dr. Gay Crooks, thank you for collaborating so much um, with our lab for your years of advice and how your critiques have helped improve my project. Uh, Dr. David Dawson, thank you for joining later on in the game. I really appreciated you joining our little bandwagon and again, your advice and critiques have really helped out my project. And another Thank you to Dr. Steve Benzinger, who couldn't be here today because his graduate student was also defending. Uh, but he also really helped uh, in moving my project forward with great advice and questions. Of course, I have to thank my, uh, my work family, the RAT Lab, and all of the members. Um, they've been with me since the beginning and it has been a beautiful experience. Um, I really want to thank Dr. Delaney Fernando, who, which I had the honor to work with in all of these projects, and I've learned so much from each and every one of them. And not only current members, past members, all of them have been a gem to work with, and I've learned so much from. Yeah, these people. 
so to get rid of the tears, <laughs> the question. <laughs> so congratulations, first of all, a really difficult project in a very new and cutting edge area. I know the tools to study these link RNAs are still being developed, so congratulations. So you know this, mm -hmm. your data better than anyone else in mm -hmm. this room. Probably better than Dinesh. <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask you, where do you see the weaknesses in your data? Where do I see the weaknesses yeah. in the data? Or um, at, least the, at least the abilities, or where, where do you feel the tools were either not there or the, or the concepts are still unknown? Where you, if you had another five years, where you would take it? Well, um, I think I think the weaknesses in this project is that it is a very novel field, and even though there are available techniques, techniques every day are being uncovered to better study these link RNAs. Some of them we've uncovered by carrying them out. Um, so I think that's where the weakness falls. It's a very novel field. If I had more years, I would point out multiple more isoforms because this locus is very complex. Um, in addition, I've, I've found sequences that have homologous, that, that's homologous to the human barrier in mice, and I'm hoping to find the full construct so that it can be targeted later on for my lab. So if I had five more years, yes, I would do, you know, looking at the role in hematopoiesis, how they can affect pathogenesis in vivo, um, and all these different studies. But you know, I think science in general always going to have, you know, holes and weaknesses because it is a tough field, it's tough to carry out, but you just keep on doing experiments until you find something. So just to, to mm. expand on that though, yeah. within, the, within the link RNA field, mm. what do you think is, is the big, uh, some of the biggest technical hurdles in studying these particular types of RNAs? These particular types of RNAs. Um, I think some of the hurdles is that uh, some link RNAs are actually, can be circular, some of them are not polyadenylated or 5 metal guanosine cap. So for example, race, which tries to identify um, mature transcripts, would not be able to detect it. You know, um, also, some of these link RNAs are no more as precursors of, of microRNAs. So because they're a vast repertoire of what they are, you know, there's not a defined technique in order to identify them. And you have to keep every day uh, looking at new avenues of how to detect them. So I think that's where um, that lies. Yes. I'll ask a couple yes. questions. <laughs> thank you for making me realize I should thank my Dalmatian at my thesis <laughs> months ago. That would have been nice. Um, so I'll ask, uh, and congratulations on a, on a great thesis and a really nice presentation. So, uh, so I have a couple of really specific questions. Um, so the Valor 6, siRNA experiments you showed, mm -hmm. and I, I may have missed some of it in the busyness of the slide and the details, but it looked mm -hmm. like one SI had phenotypic effects and the other one didn't. Yes, so siRNA2 actually was had the strongest phenotypic effect in not only the two cell lines I showed, but other cell lines that I've also um, tested, MB411 and NUM6 cells. So yes, that's why in our uh, Validation microarray, we kind of focus on that one in particular, so it seems that was strongest phenotypic effects, yes. Okay, so, but looking at the mm -hmm. knockdown mm -hmm. just of the gene or of the mm -hmm. link RNA, there was really no difference between the two in terms of, so, so you can't really lay it at the feet of, well, this is just a better, you know, siRNA. So, mm -hmm. what about the design of those two siRNAs? Is there mm -hmm. something there that might tell you what isoform to actually focus on in terms of function? So, yes, so interestingly, um, so these SIs were, de were designed against the splice junctions, particularly between um, exon 4 and intron 4, and intron 4, exon 5. Intron 4, exon 5 with siRNA2. Um, I used these siRNAs and I tested all the isoforms that I uncovered to see if it got downregulated, and I saw the strongest consistency of downregulation by siRNA2 of all of the isoforms. Um, but siRNA2 actually had a very strong phenotype specifically in RH cells. So it also varied a little bit from cell line to cell line. But I'm primarily focused on siRNA2 because that SI against the splice junction showed the most consistently among the other uh, isoforms. Now, yes, it reveals some interesting data. And what's interesting is that in intron 4 specifically, there is a very strong 
strong conservation um, of homologa sequences there all along vertebrates. So there may be something more happening there we still haven't uncovered. I did obtain some um, race sequences uh, that uh, matched up to intron 4, but I still haven't cloned out uh, another isochron containing that sequence. But that's also ongoing. So I, I noticed you took the focus of looking at the transcriptional aspects of, of these mm -hmm. link RNAs. I mean, did you guys spend any time looking at its role possibly in translation uh, and post-transcriptional regulation of proteins or function? Might that have some, might that explanation for its regulation of SP1, you know, transcription and things like that lie in that part of the molecule's potential function? Yes, that there, there is a possibility. I think with our um, like grain analysis, we kind of focused on what was mostly significant. And since there was something very interesting with transcription factors, we pursued that avenue. Um, but yes, it is possible they could be involved in translation. So for that, um, what we could do is specifically look at the isoforms, look at if there's any interesting motif or sequences that could match up to any other messenger RNAs or motifs that maybe a particular protein um, may interact with would be very interesting. Um, I did um, carry out uh, RNA immunoprecipitation uh, trying to see if they were, specifically if SP1 interacted with Bayer 6. I couldn't say in definitely that it did uh, because of the background data. Um, so it could be interacting with different proteins. That I haven't uncovered yet. Uh, we have some preliminary data on Baylor 2 potential interactors with it. Um, but no, we have not looked at those avenues, but they would be interesting to pursue. Okay, so and like in microRNAs, they use FlipSeq and things yes. like that. Can you yes. do that so, with microRNAs? Yeah, so RNA-seq would be a good way to look at, um, again, transcript level. Um, in terms of translation, I think it'll be a little bit harder, we have to really focus on changes in the protein level. Because um, you wouldn't, you may not see changes at the mRNA phase. Uh, for example, if they're involved in translation, the mRNA was going to stay stable while the protein levels go up. So there would be uh, other assays and able to decipher them. Uh, we are carrying out right now SHIP PCR specifically to look at failure sick and see if its presence or absence does affect the ability of SP1 to bind to different chromatin targets. So that's another avenue we're trying to explore and see if we see something there. Um, so, so yes, there's other things that we can pursue and we haven't. And so I'm not a keen yeah. guy, I'm more interested in solid tumors. D yes. Is there any reason to suspect these particular link RNAs might have roles outside of the hematopoietic system? Um, there is, there is data on the expression of these link RNAs in different tissues, uh, but specifically for Baylor 6, it's mostly isolated to uh, lymphoid cells and lymphoid tissues. So in that case, I believe it may be more tissue specific. Uh, we, would, we would have to do analyses on different organs, uh, tissues, and see the expressions and see this. Um, so it is a possibility, but we still haven't covered. But I think more in vivo models will help us look at the effects, particularly um, if we do a model, uh, not only with Baylor 6, but with a really strong driver, and see what effects it has in the model and tumors that arise if we see expression of Baylor 6 in those tumors. And then I promise last question. Oh, so, yeah. um, so um, in the initial yeah. analysis where you pick these link RNAs, so you picked four what mm -hmm. appear to be upregulated oncogenic link mm -hmm. RNAs. I was just wondering in that data set to what extent mm -hmm. the majority of the link RNAs you see would be presumed to be oncogenic or if, if, if that's the tendency in hematopoietic malignancies that link RNAs would be oncogenic or if there's a subset that are still suppressive in terms of so, um, tumor genesis. Yeah, so it, at the beginning I did show a small table of some of the studies of uh, link RNAs in AML and AL, and some of them are can act as tumor suppressors, not just oncogenes. Now, in the list of our link RNAs, um, we did focus on the ones we thought oncogenic, but there were link RNAs that were significantly lower than normal B cells, so they could have a tumor suppressor capacity. Uh, I think we kind of more focused on the 
pathogenic side was more of interest in, this, in the lab, but we have explored and we do have some preliminary data on potential tumor suppressive link RNA. Yes. Oh, that's uh, okay. <laughs> um, so just going back to that, so I think that I remember seeing that the Bela 2 and 6, I may be mm -hmm. wrong about this, but um, they were up in pre-Bs and that was in the human studies, right? In the human studies. In the normal pre-Bs, yeah. And pre-Bs, yeah. So how much do you think, um, knowing about the leukemias that mm -hmm. you were testing, this is a reflection of the cell of origin versus the le leukemia genesis, knowing that now that links are very, very uh, stage-specific and lineage-specific. Um, I mean, it is indicative of something going on in leukemia, specifically AL comes for precursor B cells, and we do see high expression in six at the pre-B cell stage. We also saw a trend of more pre-B cells in the hardy fractions, in the C fraction, C prime fraction particularly. Um, so, Uh, how that does that correlate with leukemia? We know um, ML, uh, there's high expression of Baylor 6 and MLL, which arises, as I mentioned, from precursor cells. Uh, what about I'm those sorry, other leukemias? Yes, yeah, so I was yeah. wondering whether the MLLs arise yeah. or at least have some sort of phenotypic pattern that suggests that they're more pre B. Yes, yeah, they tend to be um, pre B and pro B the majority, and in these cases, when we looked at the immunophenotype, we saw them to be mostly pro-B and pre-B mm -hmm. um, uh, cell types. And I don't recall, did you, did you look at the expression of those available? Well, actually, you don't know it in the mouse, do you? So this is all in the No, so, yes. Yeah, so yeah. we do have some data of Baylor 2, which we haven't shown yet um, in the different uh, mirroring B cell subsets. But in terms of bigger sites, we haven't uncovered it full homo uh, homolog, so we haven't. Because uh, when you did your transplant yeah. studies, that's with mouse cells. Yeah. Your, uh, your we transplant were studies, you're over expressing the human homolog in, in uh, bone marrow, yeah. yeah. And did you see an increase, did you say, in pre B? Because I saw LMPP, HSC, yeah. no, and then I saw B. Yes, yeah. so we saw a trend. Um, approach of uh, 
uh, CRISPR-Cas9 targeting, so you could target multiple golden varieties. One idea would be to mark the targeting Baylor 2 and Baylor 6 together um, and see what happens there. Specifically in an AL model, it would be very interesting to see if, you know, both being knocked down fully ameliorates the phenotype. So yes, it is a strong possibility. There's not just one mutation in any particular cancer, so there could be a variety of linker RNAs mutated. That could also be why we don't see such a strong change in phenotype. Oh, you so see a modest change. Yes. Have, like, three or four of them yes. 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 And I think with the new approaches coming up in lab, that's going to be a possibility and something that can be explored further. Do you think that's just something that? They, uh, yeah, I only put a few of there, but there's a lot of um, uh, studies, particularly, you know, of um, epithelial cancers um, with monoclonal RNAs. And the interesting thing about it is that linker RNAs can be found in different bodily fluids. So you can actually, you know, look at the expression and use it as a prognostic marker without do, doing anything invasive into the patient. And you can predict, you know, the outcome or if it's going to be, you know, resistant to treatment that way. So it's a very nice, viable way of uh, treating the patient without, like, being completely invasive. Um, and it is underappreciated. We still haven't moved forward with that because you would, you would need to, you know, do quantitative real-time PCR and have all these systems readily available. But it's an avenue that would be very good and would be very appealing. So hopefully it'll get more interest and more movement. Yeah. So congrats. Um, is there isoforms part of the story that you're discussing? Mm -hmm. There's, you know, a small phenotype there showing that different isoforms may correlate with severity. Can you see do you mm -hmm. have the ability or how do you start going back to your clinical samples that you looked at earlier to see if you can start discerning different isoforms of wind RNAs with the worst problem? So yes, yeah, so actually we were able to, well I didn't show it here, but we were able to match up uh, the different probes, the linker RNAs. I've only showed here a couple of the probes, but there are multiple for the different linker RNAs. Uh, and in that way, we could look at a different ice forms. I haven't looked specifically. Um, I do know that the probes that I'm covered uh, do match um, exon 5, so definitely for isoform 1, I do see something. Um, there's also probes matching different unannotated sequences that I have uncovered but still haven't cloned out that isoform. But yes, it would be very interesting to go back and look at that and see if there's probes matching any of the unannotated sequences that I've uncovered. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.